Hi, I'm Gail Rubin. Stay tuned for today's episode of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Welcome to today's show brought to you by the fine folks at French Funerals and Cremations. As the doyen of death, check out the pearls, I'm all about getting the funeral planning conversation started. A doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject, and that would be me when it comes to the party no one wants to plan, a funeral or memorial service. By thinking about what you'd want in your funeral and having that conversation before there's a death or illness, you can reduce stress at a time of grief, minimize family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. That's what this program is all about. Just as talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead and your family will benefit from the conversation. So let's get this conversation started. Our special guest today to discuss what it's like to face your own impending death at some point, we never know, is Brother Arturo Olivas. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So you are a Franciscan brother. Yes, I am. And you have lung cancer that you've had for a while. Tell me a little bit about your diagnosis and, and what you're facing. I was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, advanced lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, on September 16, 2011. And when St. Francis uh, went to uh, the Holy Land, uh, to evangelize, but also to um, negotiate with um, uh, leaders of the Islamic community there, he came upon a pre-existing order of brothers who were serving lepers and, and the poor in Jerusalem. They wore a black robe, a black habit, with this tau emblazoned upon it. He was so impressed with the work that, that they were doing that he decided to make it his own personal signature. So over time, the Tau, this ancient form of the cross, uh, became the symbol for the Franciscan order. And what we see here are the arms of Christ and the arm of, of Francis overlaid. Oh. And uh, the arm of Francis is indicated by the, the long sleeve, and the arm of Christ is, is just an, a, a bare uh, arm, but they both have the stigmata. Oh, interesting. Exactly. So this has become the habit for the secular Franciscans in the United States. Did, did St. Francis develop stigmata? In his yes, he was he the first Christian saint mm -hmm. uh, recorded to have received the stigmata. Wow. And so in this way, in this very physical way, uh, he was like a second Christ. Hmm. So what else have you done in terms of preparing for your good goodbye? Well, in addition to uh, the legal things, you know, the paperwork, you know, to make sure everything's in order, designating beneficiaries, making sure um, retirement and insurance policies and all these things, my assets, uh, both financial and, and physical material, uh, are taken care of. Um, I have been saying goodbye. I expected it to be a short goodbye, but it's turning out to be a longer goodbye. And that's fine because I have a lot of people to say goodbye to. And one of the ways I've been doing that is by giving things away that have you know, significance to me, you know, some very important uh, uh, re relevance to my life. Uh, and principally, principally, I've been giving them away to friends and family. Uh, little trinkets, artwork, uh, things that I have, again, that I've collected over time that have meaning uh, for me. Mm -hmm. um, as an artist, I'm very, I, I, I relate to things, to the physical world, to tangible things. Uh, and so I want to leave them behind and, and do that in a way that I can personalize it now 
um, that I won't be able to, you know, once I'm done. In fact, I was uh, given the honor of attending a funeral for a Native American woman who was buried, it was very green burial um, kind of burial. It was in a pioneer cemetery between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And she was wrapped in colorful blankets mm -hmm. and lowered down. But after the burial took place and everybody stayed and helped fill in the grave. Mm -hmm. And boy, talk about a cathartic experience. That hard physical work of helping to bury someone can actually really be a healing experience. Uh, after she was buried, they had brought all this stuff of hers and said, take it. Take her stuff. Give away. Give away. You know, and they were even saying, blue light special. <laughs> Everything's got to go. And that brought a levity to the proceedings. And also, just practically, it was like her, um, her partner didn't want to hold on to that stuff. So it was a beautiful thing. In fact, I got a, a, a lovely pink uh, kind of Buddha figure. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, ooh, this speaks to me. Well, the giveaway <laughs> is a very important thing for me to do because, mm -hmm. again, as a Franciscan, you know, I try to live a simple life. But also, having taught for 30 years, mm -hmm. I've collected and amassed a lot of things. The teachers don't throw anything yeah. away. Oh, yeah. You never know when you're going <laughs> to need it in the classroom. So one of the things that I have been doing, both addressing the practical need of, of, of letting things go and, and part of my spirituality of trying to live a simple life and, and, and helping people to have the things that they need, has been giving things away. Mm -hmm. So one of my goals is to clear out my garage, uh, <laughs> which which doesn't sound quite as fun as much fun as your experience um, in receiving the yeah. pink Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> but f for me, it's been taking the form of giving these these things away to uh, predominantly friends and family, and and having a conversation with them, mm -hmm. and when necessary, um, healing any relationship wounds that need to be healed. Very important. Yes. Yeah. And as a um, Franciscan brother, you don't have kids, you're not married. So that, as a single person, has its elements of preparing as well. But you've uh, handled that paperwork financially as well. Yes, and I've had, mm -hmm. I've had help uh, mm -hmm. with friends and family you know, who have had some experience with doing this on their own. Uh, and then coming to my immediate assistance um, and so I, I've definitely benefited from that. And um, again, one of the things that I've been doing have, has, has included uh, making sure that I reach out to folks who I haven't um, reached out to recently and, and, and saying my goodbye. Um, a tentative goodbye, because I'm still here, but a goodbye nonetheless. Um, you know, in the past I've had experiences where friends and family uh, have died, and I, I've not learned of their, dis, their, their, their demise uh, for some time. And I wondered, um, you know, why I hadn't heard from them, and I had hoped that uh, there was something I could do uh, before they had died. And I didn't want to, to have that experience for myself. So I made a point of making my, my cancer and the, the terminal aspect of it uh, very well known. Uh, I wanted people to be aware of what was going on with me. Um, so that there wouldn't be a regret, you know, on their part or my part that a contact, a connection, uh, you know, wasn't made when, when it could have been made. And so I've been very public about, you know, my condition. And so I've gone on Facebook. I've been an email doyen, if one can say that, uh, in terms of, of uh, bringing back relationships and, and reestablishing connections. Mm -hmm. And, you know... It is so important to live each day with that thought in mind that, you know, this could be the last time I say goodbye to this person. My uh, next door neighbors, uh, beautiful couple, for a while I was traveling back to the East Coast for months at a time, and the gentleman was facing a, a terminal uh, cancer condition. and. When I left, I, I met with him before I, I left on that trip, and I had this feeling this was the last time I was going to see him alive. And I told him it was an honor to know him. 
And he said, it was an honor to know you. And you can tell I still get a little choked up about this, but... Um, I'm headed in that direction, too. <laughs> <laughs> it, I am so glad that I said that when I did, because we never know when we're going to see a person for the last time in this, in this lifetime. We all know we're going to die. Mm -hmm. We all know that we're going to leave this plane of existence. Um, we, may, we may not plan for it, but we know that. Um, and so it's always prudent to be aware of that, to live in the moment. Um, I've always been aware of the necessity of living in the moment. You know, again, going back to my Franciscan spirituality, it's all about the now. It's all about being present to the moment. Um, but in the course of our living, the thing, you know, we're so overwhelmed by the things that we need to do that we think that, uh, okay, we'll have some time to say those goodbyes. We'll have some time to heal those relationships. We'll have some time to bring resolution to um, whatever is not resolved in our lives. We'll have some time to say to a friend or family member, or coworker, whoever, you know, I really appreciate you. I value you. I love you. That doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that message has really been driven home to me. Uh, and so again, in my giveaways, um, in my Facebook messages, in my email misses, um, in the talks that I've given in radio, and the interviews on print, and now on television, a very important message is definitely be present to the moment, but not just to the moment in terms of what you are experiencing, present to the people in your lives, so that you don't need an imminent death to tell that person that you value them, you appreciate them, or that you're sorry, or that you welcome their forgiveness. Do it now while you can. It's part of prudent planning for death. And, and living life to the fullest. And living life to the fullest, because to live to the life, living your life to the fullest also includes recognizing that at some point it will end. Mm -hmm. So do the things that you can do now while you can. That's right. We talked about a number of things over the course of this um, whole series of interviews on A Good Goodbye. Everything from the practical issues of planning, whether that's planning ahead or cremation or burial, to talk about the financial issues, uh, everything from estate planning and, and the financial details that are involved with life and death, uh, and personalizing them. And I, I congratulate you for everything that you're doing and helping all of us to learn to really live in the moment and appreciate our loved ones and say I love you to your people you love. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now while you can. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Any other tips you'd like to um, talk about? Absolutely. You know, I have learned that the human heart can encompass so many emotions at the same time. When I first received my, my diagnosis, as I mentioned earlier, I went into shock. And then the practical, prudent side of planning my death kind of clicked in. And so I addressed those issues. And now that I'm living longer than expected, I realize that um, life is a continuum. Our emotions are a continuum. Our heart, our mind, can, our spirit can encompass so many different things at the same time. So as you plan for your death, continue to live. As you plan for your death, continue to experience those things that are important to you while you, while you are alive. Mm -hmm. um, and allow yourself to feel the full range of emotions that comes with planning to die. But don't neglect living. Are you still painting? I am still painting. In fact, I'm preparing, now? well, I'm preparing uh, uh, a few uh, panels, paintings for um, patrons, for some commissions. I decided this year not to do Spanish Market, uh, which I had done previously for 15 years. It was a big part of my um, life as an artist. Uh, it helped create a community of artists that supported me at the time of my diagnosis. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, in November of 2011, um, colleagues in my art community came together and sponsored a fundraising event for me called Art is a Gift. And uh, this event was held at Working Classroom uh, here in town. Uh, and so artists and, and others donated um, artworks and, and other sorts of things uh, that were 
auctioned off and sold off and to raise money for my medical attention. Um, and so I continue to paint, uh, but I've decided to, to downscale the amount of painting I'm doing um, and focus really on individual commissions. It's a way, about, it's a way of, of getting deeper into what I'm doing um, to enhance the experience and, and to kind of avoid the pitfall of getting too busy for the sake of, of, of commissions, for the sake of producing uh, quantity over quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, a way of getting deeper into uh, my experience as an artist, which mm -hmm. is a part of my spirituality as well. Is, are you uh, doing san santo work? I am doing santo work. And in the New Mexican tradition, um, if you are creating santos, it's typically of one of two kinds, or some people paint both or create both. Um, I paint, I'm primarily a painter, and so uh, images of my saints called santos are painted images, and those are called retablos because they're painted on a wooden panel. Okay. Folks who carve, uh, who carve in the round, create what are called bultos. And if the subject matter is of a saint, then it's also a santo. So santos could be in the form of a painting on a panel, a retablo, mm -hmm. or a carving in the round called a bulto. And we have some very talented artists um, who do both. So they create paintings and statues in the round. Have you done any San Rafaels? I have done San Rafael many times. And uh, I, I, I want to ask you San, why you ask that. Well, I love San Ra <laughs> I collect little San Rafaels. Uh -huh. um, San Rafael is uh, one of the archangels and is depicted with wings, but always with a staff that has a gourd on it in one hand and a fish, holding onto a fish. Absolutely. And usually in boots. Mm -hmm. And I collect cowboy boots. My, uh, I have 15 pair. <laughs> so, and, and usually a, like a scalloped... Uh, skirt or, you know, dress or, but of course, angels are, are not uh, male or female, but it seems to me that San Rafael looks the most female-ish in the depictions that I've seen. So. I'm very interested that you asked about San Rafael because he is one of the patrons of healing. Yes. As, yes. as you probably know. Because the fish is the magic healing fish of Bethesda. There you go. And his name <laughs> means God heals. Uh, and so I have often painted him in the context of a patron um, who had a need for healing of some sort or another. Uh, and so he's one of my favorites because of that association with healing. And also happy meetings, happy couples, uh, good travels. Absolutely. All, patron all of children. Of, yeah. Excellent. Exactly. All sorts of good things. Exactly. So San Rafael is up there in, in my list. Okay. Well, I hope you'll make one for me. Maybe. It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> With cowboy boots. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and um, what else might might we leave our viewers with in terms of any words of wisdom you want to share about as we look look our mortality in the face? It takes a great degree of degree of courage to face our mortality, um, and sometimes our courage fails us. And I say, do not be discouraged. Allow the full range of emotions that are part and parcel of our human nature. You know, the fear, the anxiety, um, the grieving, the sorrowing that comes, even with anticipating one's own death. That's been a big part of my process. Mm -hmm. uh, grieving the fact that I will probably not live as long as I imagined I would. Mm -hmm feeling sorry for the grief that my loved ones are going to experience. So allow yourself to feel the full range of emotions. Acknowledge it, embrace it, and then move beyond that. Mm -hmm. Do that with the help of friends, of family, people who can support you, uh, counselors, spiritual advisors, and so on. And be active. I have found that remaining to live in this world to do the things that I love to do have helped me to prepare to say goodbye. Wonderful. And when you are painting, do you get into another mindset when your attention is focused on doing your paintings? Or Absolutely. Artwork? I'm very easily distracted. <laughs> Shiny thing. <laughs> and so whenever I can focus on a particular activity, especially gardening, which is actually my most favorite thing to do. 
But when I'm focused on an activity such as painting, and when I'm painting a particular subject that is, has particular resonance for me, like San Rafael, like mm -hmm. the one I'm going to plan to paint for you, <laughs> I enter into um, a kind of meditative state. You know, the orthodox tradition of painting images of the saints is called writing an icon. Writing an icon. Writing an icon, because they see the act of creating a sacred image uh, as evangelization, as spreading the good news. And so through the use of symbols, which are a kind of um, um, dictionary, a kind of um, alphabet, a message is conveyed. And so as I am painting my retablos, repeating a symbol that I've painted many times before, like the staff that you referenced for San Rafael or the fish, it has greater and greater significance. I find deeper and deeper layers of meaning and that helps to settle my mind, it helps to calm me down, helps me to get deeper into the act of creating the sacred image, connects to my spirituality as a Franciscan. And it also reminds me that I'm still alive, I'm doing something that I love. And, and the concept of being healthy while one is experiencing a terminal illness is a concept that has really come to, to my mind that uh, I have not found in many resources that I've accessed, you know, to help me get through this. So working on my work, my artwork, my gardening work, all the things that I love to do, have helped me realize that in many respects I am healthy. I'm still able to do things even in the midst of this terminal cancer that I'm experiencing. And we're making the most of every single day. Living in the moment. Living in the moment. Well, Brother Arturo Olivas, thank you so much for coming and being with us today. This has been an awesome conversation. You are welcome. And I think uh, our viewers are going to take a lot away from this. And as we wrap up our whole series here, again, I want to thank the French family of companies for supporting the program. Don't forget, you can find out more about our topic today, as well as a number of great resources from my website, agoodgoodbye.com. Remember, talking about sex won't make you pregnant, and talking about funerals won't make you dead. Start a conversation today. Proper estate planning enables you to pass your possessions and your assets to the people and organizations that you care about. By planning with a living trust, you could avoid the high cost of probate and minimize taxation. The attorneys at Morris Hall have been helping thousands of clients pass their assets as they intended. To schedule your free consultation, call us at 505-889-0100 or visit us at morristrust.com. A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die is a light touch on a serious subject. The book has everything you need to know before you go. A Good Goodbye helps you reduce stress and family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. It's available in paperback and all ebook formats through online retailers and at agoodgoodbye.com. Start a conversation today. Why are we talking about this at the dinner table? Just put my ashes in a coffee can or something. Please pass the salt, dear. Can I help you, ma'am? Yeah. Which can would you recommend putting my mom's ashes in? Uh, I think I heard ashes. I'm sorry, my mom's cremated remains. <laughs> that sounds the same. My mom didn't even like coffee. She drank tea. You can't avoid your funeral. Pre-plan and take the burden off someone else.
Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die, and creator of The Newly Dead Game. The Newly Dead Game is like the classic TV show The Newly Wed Game, but the questions test how well you know someone else's last wishes. It's a fun way to get the funeral planning conversation started. For more information about The Newly Dead Game, visit agoodgoodbye.com. How can you eat like that? Relax, dude. I'm freaking dead. It's one of the perks. I can eat whatever the hell I want. How do I get in on this? What, the whole death thing? Yeah. First off, I mean, look at what you're eating. No wonder you've lived this long. Feed this to the village cow, all right? Bring him a glass of your finest expired milk. Oh, before you go checking out, do you have a will? Any funeral arrangements, plans like that? Did you? No. And because of that, now my family's in turmoil. They're fighting, bickering over money. Now they're dead broke. Do some real planning, okay? Before you figure out your exit strategy. See? Everybody's doing it. I can't wait to get started. I've never seen anybody dying to die like you. Good luck, kid. Thank you. 